this started that I, uh, I was presenting at the White House um, panel um, with the White House Office of Innovation, a guy named David Wilkinson was on my panel. It was about um, people with disabilities and incarceration. And my, my uh, area was to cover people with mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. So I was up there speaking. David Wilkinson was speaking about the Data Driven Justice Initiative out of the White House at the time. I said it sounds really interesting because you know I kind of like to collect my data. Mm -hmm. um, we signed up the next day, and at some point thereafter, they were trying to build out the program. So they asked if we could get a few other departments or sheriffs to sign on. We were able to get 21 police departments to sign on very quickly. We sent out an email. We followed up with a couple of calls, and basically 21 signed up very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, we sort of had created some some weight to um, our initiative. Um, that I think drew the attention of the White House Office of Innovation and Laura uh, and Lynn, who worked there, and then moved on to Arnold Foundation. I'll let her tell a little bit more about that. Um, just a, the the problem. Do you release, Kevin? Uh, no, we'll send that. We'll, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Sorry to interrupt. So, um, so just a, a statement of the problem. Um, you know, those that are incarcerated, 80 percent self-reported drug or alcohol addicted, probably higher actually, at least more related to substance use disorder. 42% of our population off the street have to be medically detoxed for drugs or alcohol, predominantly for opioids right now. 50% um, have a history of mental health when they come into our shop. Mm -hmm. And if you consider those with mental health, the co-occurrence issue, which is uh, those that have mental health issue are much more highly likely to have a substance use disorder. 76% of our population has mental health, also has a, 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 a substance use disorder. Uh, when you consider we've had about 108, we, we, Lowell General at their ER, they'll hit about, about 100,000 per year. About 2016, they began 100,000 visits. In our shop in 2016, we had 180,000 medical attendances in our shop. It's a small shop. Um, I like and how you call it a shop. Yeah, was that? Yeah, high just, school. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and and basically, and then when you think, consider the mental health issue, that we're the largest provider of mental health treatment services in the county, and the three largest in the country are L.A., Rikers, and Cook County jails. The three largest mental health treatment providers in the entire country are jails. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of spoken with you guys before, the idea that, um, you know, the things that are ailing society manifest themselves in certain people. Uh, I call them the canaries in the coal mine, the people that are more vulnerable for whatever mm -hmm. reason, they end up incarcerated, involved mm -hmm. in the criminal justice system, and that's a lot of these folks. So the, uh, so tell us what the essence of what it is you're announcing today. I'm still just a little bit... Yep, so let me just, one, one last thing, emergency rooms also. So the issues of mm -hmm. mental health and in substance use disorders are clogging up our jails and our emergency mm -hmm. rooms. Since 2010 to 14, emergency room visits where the primary prognosis was mental health disorder rate rose 27% over those four years. So this is something that is affecting all of us. This is an effort to actually, you know, get people so that they don't have to come to jail to be able to treat them in the community so they don't have to come to jail. So it's basically an effort to initially identify super utilizers. We'll show you some, let me give you this mm -hmm. right now, Chris, so you can kind of see one of the things I'm talking about. All right, to identify super utilizers. Amara, I don't know if you, you're busy typing, you. but if you want to take a look at that. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a proof of concept, and we've got a couple of others here. I know the chief will probably speak, but this is from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, this is a 26-year-old female uh, over a period of four years. You could see she's got 14 uh, contacts with police and 14 contacts with EMS, right? This is one of the super utilizers. Now, you may not even realize it if you're a police because, number one, you see only one time when she was charged with a crime, right? Uh, defendant only in one. The rest, she's a victim or witnesses, which is not unusual for this population. And then the police wouldn't necessarily especially know about all these overdoses as well. So this is someone that, because of the silos uh, that are created through law enforcement, through hospitals or community health centers and others, there are people that are super utilizers that we're not identifying, and the idea is to be able to identify them and get them the help that they need. So we've got silos between uh, corrections, police, first responders, mm -hmm. community health centers, hospitals, homeless shelters, Medicaid can provide a lot of great information. And the idea is to use this um, to identify those that are most critical need. The to, data. The data to identify people with the most critical need, break down the silos, create mm -hmm. one platform, which is something that this initiative will do, mm -hmm create one large platform that everyone can drop the information, identify them across all these boundaries, jurisdictional, departmental, and otherwise, identify those in the greatest need, and then be able to try to get them connected with the support services that they need. So that, number one, we don't divert them away from arrest or divert them away from jail. We actually divert them to 
supports and resources that they before use. they get in trouble before or you know yeah as they're becoming engaged with law enforcement and others yes at that point we can direct them in there and yeah and then to use that data to find to kind of go do some more outreach as well before they get into trouble mm -hmm. a lot of times these are not real trouble they're just nuisance crimes nuisance issues yet the police really don't have you no, know we're not talking terrible felons here no right? no no we're talking about the people that, you know, you probably get, I'm sure in Lowell you've got the same people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even Teddy Panos, when I was on the show with him the other day, he said these are the same people he sees out in the street. And he actually said, um, you know, they, they, they seem like they're more likely or as likely to be victims of crime mm -hmm. than anything else. So they seem to be suffering out there. And that's exactly who we're trying to connect services with to be able to, again, divert them away from criminal justice system where it can exacerbate a problem, mm -hmm. but to divert them to the, the solutions, to the resources they need. I'm pretty proud of the program we have. But you shouldn't have to come to jail to get good program. We should be able to give that to you before you have to come to jail in the first place. Plus, it's very expensive. And we've got a lot of data to show the expense of this population as they hit, you know, um, police, as they hit corrections, as they hit all sorts of other social service agencies and emergency rooms. And the cost is pretty exorbitant for a small population of chronically ill, chronically in need. Uh, participants. And you're a capacity in Bill Ricker too, right? No, we actually, we're, uh, we're actually, no, we're not a capacity. No. We can always, we can always take some more. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, if they don't need to come to jail, right. I mean, you know, it, jail for some people can be a good thing, right? Um, because it can be a break and a window of opportunity to treatment. For, for a lot of people, especially those mental health issues, it can only exacerbate because you take them out of their life, you take them out of their job, you take them, you know, they lose their license. Uh, they, they, their, their connections with their families become, you know, uh, problematic, and so it really can just ruin their lives. After How many that. inmates are there now in Bill Got about eight to nine hundred incarcerated and right what's now. What's the capacity? I mean, total. If you had every bed filled, it'd be a total of fifteen hundred. But it's not. But it's not. You know, you can't do that because you don't have that perfect number of classification to fill every bed. And there's nothing in Cambridge anymore, right? Nothing in Cambridge. No, we're in Bill right is now. Bill is it. That's it. Yes. So how does the foundation figure into this? Yep. Go ahead. Perfect. Um, well, we're providing. We'll, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Okay. Perfectly. 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 Yeah, we've got, we're going to solve all of this. Um, no, we, so as the sheriff mentioned, we actually started this project at the White House. And what we did was we spent a lot of time talking to communities across the country to understand how common of a problem this was. What we discovered is it's, it's very common. We have not talked to a single community that doesn't see this as an issue. People with this complex combination of needs who are ending up disproportionately hitting all of our emergency systems. So it's interesting, we started, we really started with the criminal justice system, uh, but we moved out and what we recognize is that it's, it's EMTs, it's police, it's uh, hospitals, homeless shelters. So these are folks who are kind of, uh, they suffer from mental illness, substance use, chronic health problems. They're not getting proactive services. So they kind of bounce in between all of these different systems. None of those systems talk to each other. So they get very fragmented and uncoordinated care. So I remember there was one community I was talking to, you know, we often talk about case management as one solution mm -hmm. to this, right, where you can assign somebody to help people navigate all these different systems. When they started to dig in on their population, they actually found that folks had multiple case managers. So somebody had a housing counselor, they had a probation officer, and they had a drug counselor. And none of those three people talked, right? None <laughs> so of them the whole reason for having a case manager. Right. Uh, so they had a case manager for, for one system. Were, were the case managers were siloed. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, and he's got to love the silo talk, you know, if he makes it down here. That's, that's, he doesn't like to talk about silos? He just hates silos. He hates hate silos. Breaking this down silos. Breaking yeah. down silos. That's exactly what yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So the interesting, I think the interesting thing that we learned was this is a problem everywhere. Um, people have a lot of really good ideas, mm -hmm. but fundamentally, um, we will never get past this kind of emergency response mode until we can figure out how we can actually find folks outside of these systems. So for us, step one is the data, right? You have to figure mm -hmm. out if you can find who this person is and look as depressing as this progress yeah. is for this individual yeah. we had all we had 28 opportunities to intervene with this person mm -hmm. if we knew earlier on this was somebody who needed something other than than whatever this emergency mm -hmm. response was so whether it was the you know the revival and the trip to the hospital or it was the talking to the police officer if we knew that this was somebody who was on this trajectory we could do something more effective so for us uh, when, I, when we transitioned over to the from the white house to the foundation now, the main change for us was we have resources. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically stuck with being persuasive when I was at the White House. Mm -hmm. But now we have some resources. And so we really started to take a step back and say, what are the things that we can do as a foundation? We can't solve this problem with mm -hmm. our funding. Uh, but what we need to be able to demonstrate is how can we actually show that this works in communities? Um, and by working, I think we all recognize that over the course. So this is a two-year pilot program. 
at the end of two years, we're not going to come back to you and say we've solved this problem. Mm -hmm. um, but we are hopefully going to be able to say we had a lot more coordination across all of these different systems. One of the reasons we really came to Middlesex was because Middlesex is unique in that they have such strong law enforcement buy-in. So we came to Middlesex partly because we met the sheriff first. Yeah. The number of chiefs, though, that are already doing things. So for us, half of the battle is really getting law enforcement, and it actually hasn't been that hard. Law enforcement, because they have been disproportionately called on to solve these problems, right? They are the kind of the tip of the social spear mm -hmm. these days. Is that whenever there's a problem in the community, 911 gets called and law enforcement right. is dispatched. So they have been doing almost everything they can with the resources that they have in their toolkits. Um, and so we also saw there was a tremendous amount of innovation that was happening in these police departments. But Middlesex County is 53 cities and towns, and yeah. you have, what was the number you used, 21? 23 now. But, but so what had happened initially, so what had happened was when we said we want to sign up, they said, can you get some others in? We said, sure, we sent something out. We got 21 right off the bat. Okay. Now, we didn't really so have... So you hit every department. Yeah, we hit everyone, every department. Now, I mean, a lot of them probably just didn't pay attention to the email. They didn't notice the email. No fault, but we didn't really have much to announce except would you like to join this with us. We've been waiting until this grant was coming through when now, with this grant resources, we'll have a project manager, which will be able to be, you know, we can fund at a high enough level so it'll be someone that'll be really professional, really driven, and really coordinate all of the, hopefully we'll get 54, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll get 54, but the hope is to get Does buy-in. 53? Yeah, it's 54, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Lowell, in, the Lowell yeah. uh, Lowell's never, Lowell's its own, its own county itself, isn't it? It <laughs> Um, no, but actually, to, so once we get that going, then we can have an Lowell ability to converse yeah. and to yes, uh, yeah. communicate. Lowell is one of our most active participants. <laughs> yes. 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 Actually, Lowell, Lowell's been great. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so then we can actually have a program manager that can then work with all the departments to keep them informed and keep them communicated with, and that way they will understand what's going on. I didn't want to like sign them up and have it just be a nothing thing for a long period of time, which is how, what happened. How much is the grant for? So uh, three communities, it's $1.6 wow. We can get you the specific breakdown for Middlesex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but we're basically providing the program manager. So when I talk about coordination, it's both, for us, it's both from a data and technology perspective, mm -hmm. but it's also the human perspective. Um, so we, we're giving both. So we're giving a data scientist, program manager, plus a technology platform. So, they, so they're providing a platform that everyone can upload onto, cloud-based, mm -hmm. and then also, so they get the program manager, and then they've got an IT specialist that mm -hmm. can then go to, you know, Tewksbury or Groton or all the other ones that may not have an IT expert to be able to help them get all their data uploaded onto the cloud in a format that'll work. So, mm -hmm. so that the smaller towns that would like to participate will be able to participate as well. They'll have that expertise for them. So I, 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 oh, so go ahead. Who gave you the grants from where? Oh, okay. From the that, foundation. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, okay. Arnold Foundation, yeah. Thank you. So this, to me, this is a really monumental change in the way that law enforcement looks at some of these issues. It is. Like I would expect the countries of Scandinavia and Norway and Finland to do something like this. Oh, his kid. Watch out. When people start over. Hello, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that like was so just the test. Everybody <laughs> start scratch again. Go. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. By the way, Lynn, this is uh, Jim Campanini. Hi, Lynn Overman from the Arnold Foundation. Local legend. Campanini, nice Chief. to see you again. So we just started a little bit of the initial stuff, Jim. Um, I was told to use the term silos. I've already been used the term silos. Yeah, we do not like silos. So yeah, no, we've been talking about breaking down silos, and Chris said that's something you always kind of are, are interested in. So that's uh, that's a little bit about it. Chris, you tell me how much do you want us to review anything with Jim? No, or? I think he'll be able to slide right in. Okay. So, right. so this program, like I said, I see this happening in Western Europe, really not necessarily Middlesex County. Um, Chief, could you give us an example of someone that you've encountered that is not, as we said earlier, is a felon, but just someone who, you know, maybe had a, some bad luck, gone in the wrong crowd, but doesn't deserve to be in prison? And, you know, give us an anecdote of where a program like this could help that person and keep that person out of prison and, you know, using up all those resources. Well, I mean, statistically, we interact with roughly our community service team, a part of our JDP uh, collaboration that we work with Chelmsford, Drakehead, and Barricka on. In Tewksbury alone last year, in 2017, we interacted with 468 individuals that were either substance use disorder, coexisting disorders, mental health and substance use, or straight up mental health. Mm -hmm. So we had 175 Section 12 involuntary uh, hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. We had uh, 98 overdoses. 
But with the overdoses that we had, we also sometimes had individuals in the car, three others that were in the car that weren't at overdose, but we still collected their information and then reached out and tried to get them mm -hmm. into the proper level of treatment so that we wouldn't see. So for the, the whole thing behind us is, and I think it works with the sheriff in the same way, is, is we recognized, you know, for the lack of the, the cliche that's been uh, floating around that, you know, arrest and incarceration isn't going to do anything except for make the problem worse, not necessarily make it better. So what could we do? So, you know, uh, back in probably 2013, 14, because we started carrying Narcan in 14, and it was, a, you know, a transition at that time. We opened up drug court in 2014, and I've been an active member over there since mm -hmm. then. But, you know, we've seen these populations, and I, and I was looking over super utilizers today, and I could, I, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, use the names of any individuals that we've interacted with. I'm not looking at with, but yeah. weekly, I didn't mean to give the wrong you know, impression. We, yeah, weekly, regularly, we, we deal with those that are suffering coexisting disorders, you know, that have alcohol or opiate related issues that we see regularly that we've already participated with the family in getting them a 35 and, uh, you know, in, in, incarcerated them, you know, um, in a program. Uh, with the Section 35, um, sent them to look for involuntary committals at hospitals when they were suicidal or threat to themselves or others, and placed them in protective custody on numerous occasions, both taking them to the hospital on an opioid-related issue and holding them for up to 12 hours in our cells regularly. So we, we, the way we look at this is, is, okay, in order for us to do better as a police agency now, we're going to lower the amount of times that we see this individual at domestics, mm -hmm. at PCs, at overdoses, um, at thefts, shopliftings, and car thefts, and house breaks, and everything else. If we can grab these people where there's some mental health component, and if there's some substance use disorder involved in that, if my community service team can reach out to those individuals and place them, then we're not going to see these people. We're going to reduce the amount of house breaks, reduce the amount of car breaks, the amount of shopliftings. We're going to have less OUIs. We're going to have... So that's going to be less resources from my department that are going to be spent in those areas. So that's kind of how we approach yeah. that. And then we grew. I mean, when the DDJ came around originally, we were one of the first agencies to sign on, but we already had a JDP collaboration at that point. And we, it was a natural transition for us because mm -hmm. we figured from this, we're going to only get better. We're going to get best practices because the DDJ was not just in our area. No, there are other, other parts of the country that are suffering substantially or just as mm -hmm. much as we are, and mm -hmm. they have, they've been trying other things on this that may have worked and may not have worked, mm -hmm. and we wanted to share all that information amongst all the people that were involved in the data-driven justice program so that we end up with the best practices on how we could improve what we're doing in our area. So, I mean, the DDJ, like the One Mind campaign and like our JDP grant that we just... You know, we, we applied to the JDP grant back in 2014 and got $29,000, happened to pick up 39000 from the Greater Low Health Alliance on a grant to fund a full-time clinician to work those four, four communities. Well, now we reapplied into the jail diversion grant again, and we ended up with seventy five grand, which is the exact cost of what the full-time clinician costs. Mm -hmm. And that clinician worked 16 hours in Tewksbury, 8 hours in Barricka, 8 hours in Chelmsford, 8 hours in Draken. And alone last year, one full year, um, of operation, 468 individuals that we interacted with, because even if you get arrested for a third offense OUI, you're getting a call the next day from our community service team to see if you're safe, if you're okay, if there's a way that we can get you into some sort of a detox program or treatment program if you're not held, you know what I mean, you don't end up seeing the sheriff, you're getting a call. I mean, if it's not just that overdose, it's added family domestic. If you get arrested for domestic assault and battery on a family member. Our ultimate goal would be to prevent that happening again the next time and the next time. So we get out ahead. As soon as we get our hand, it can get our hands on you, we want to try to get you into some form of treatment or some sort of... Tell about that, that, oh, that the drug court, um, just that anecdotal, the drug court um, yes. person. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, but, but I think it's a good example of how maybe you, if you intervene, you can stop a cycle. Right. So like an example, we have an individual that we, was one of our first candidates in drug court at Lowell District Court Drug. He was a Tewksbury resident and he'd been arrested 10 times for operating under the influence of alcohol. He had been in our cell regularly almost a couple of times a week for either domestic assault and battery on his mother or a family member. Had a lot of family problems associated with that, was getting PC'd on a regular basis. We got him into drug court. He was one of our first clients in drug court. We never saw him again after that at the Tewksbury Police Department. So all the resources that we were expending, holding him overnight, getting him into court, bringing him up to the hospital when he was, yeah. when he was uh, intoxicated. Ten so times? So, ten times he was arrested for OUI. Yeah, he had one of the but records. Ideally, under this program, you want to get to these folks 
Yeah. Before they're even arrested yeah. once, right? right? But but we do that often already when we get somebody that overdoses or we go to somebody's house where there isn't an arrest made, but we still have the family for, uh, problem that revolves around mental health. We have lots of mental health individuals, and a Section 12 isn't an incarceration, but it's you send them up to somebody that evaluates them, a licensed independent clinical, clinical social worker will evaluate somebody and try to get them into resources before we have to show up at their house again for a Section 12 or before it gets to a domestic assault and battery. So yes, as an example, there is plenty of people, even though we do still reach out and try to help those that we have arrested. We also reach out to those individuals that we touch okay. on a daily basis that have some level of substance use disorder or a mental health issue or a combination of the two, which is really a common denominator. Is there's a lot? Most of our substance use disorders have a mental health component, right. mm -hmm. some sort of trauma associated with that. Chief, uh, is there any data on the drug courts right now? about the success success rate or recidivism rates. I mean, they've been in operation now for three, four years. Yep. I, so, I so yep. are there any, I mean, what, what? The only thing that I can tell you right now with respect to Lowell District Court is, at this particular juncture, we happen to have, gra the, all of our graduates from 2014 to now, we have not had one of our graduates rearrested which is, I think, might be statistically, and I, I don't want to be quoted on that, but I was, there was some discussion in court the other day that there may no be, be not another drug court in existence mm -hmm. that has that data set, that there hasn't been an arrest. Yeah. 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 And the other question, because I got a call uh, last week from a mother uh, crying on the phone. She won't let me leave me her num name, but she said, uh, she said that she's been trying to get her uh, son in drug court, and she says it's only for white people. That's what she said. And I said, ma'am, give me your, your name and number, and I'll have someone contact you. I was just going to call some of the local police department or something. And, and she hung up the phone. Now, she was just making a charge off that, but she said it's only for... Now, how does drug court work? How do you get into drug court? I mean, and, and who selects who goes in there? I mean, so, so this is staffing before drug court every single Tuesday. So they're inside that staffing are clinicians. There is members of law enforcement. I happen to have been a law enforcement rep in there since court opened, but there are treatment providers, treatment programs, defense counsel, and obviously a judge in the probation. So they're all working together. It's a staffing. We discuss things about every client, and every time we have a staffing, anybody that wants to reintroduce. So probation, law enforcement, the judges themselves, anybody can introduce a client into the equation. Defense counsel introduces a lot of people into the equation that they see regularly. Um, you know, some people, it's the treatment treatment providers have seen people over and over again and can speak to them and, and recognize that they might be a good client for drug court. But So there's a lot of ways that you can get into drug court. And when, so just you have to understand that drug court is high risk, high need, though. So these are people that have had periods of incarceration already. They've had you know, multiple um, visits to treatment programs and detoxes already. So you don't want to mix a diversion person, somebody that's just early onset into addiction, with a person that's a, a, a like a high risk high need. So these are strictly trying to, people have to have jail time hold, holding over their head in order to qualify for drug court because that's what the probationary period is what qualifies. You have to have at least 18 months of probation, which is the period of drug court. So those are high risk, high need. Yeah. So a lot of people won't enter into <coughs> drug court because they don't qualify for that level of need yet. Because at the court system right now, you have to understand, if you're early on, there's a diversion program, a 16-week diversion program. I work with Marion on and a few other the, you know, people from Lowell District Court and a few other chiefs. And we opened up because we, we tested the data set. We said, okay, in Lowell, in Lowell District Court, there's about 900 offenses that would qualify for an early intervention diversion program every year okay so if we start a diversion program there like they do a juvenile diversion where instead of being arraigned for a possession of class AA or a first offense shoplifting or something associated with addiction you actually will be not you won't be arraigned you'll enter into a 16-week treatment program that the Lowell House provides the curriculum on and you're tested and you're, you're assigned a you know a uh, drug coach drug co you know drug drug program coach mm -hmm. and everything else, a recovery coach, and um, and if you make it through that program and you get your certificates within the 16 weeks, you'll never be arraigned on that offense. So that's for some early entry, and then unfortunately drug court is high risk, high need. So it's the people that are caught up in the middle until they get to the high risk, high need and get into a drug mm -hmm. court, or if they're in the middle ground, that's the people that are, t it's tough, and that might be the person that you got a call from, Brian. Okay, so if she calls again, okay, who do I? You can have her, you could relate it back to me if you want. You can relate her back to the probation department in court. You can relate it back to the <laughs> police chief 
down oh, the chute. Oh, but I can absolutely, I've brought a lot of Tooks people, I mean, you know, I, I give a little speech about the challenge coin that we give out at Drug Court graduations every single time about the, you know, the commitment that went into this, the, the level, you know, the how proud you should be of yourself and any time that you need support you can reach in your pocket hang on to something that shows the accomplishment that you had and I always throw a little caveat in there if the individuals from Tewksbury but we've graduated yeah. a lot of people from Tewksbury or and then and then I incorporate the people that come into Tewksbury for treatment and they've been in there for long-term treatment then I, I adopt them as residents <laughs> for the graduation <laughs> so I can say another Tewksbury yeah, right. resident yeah. is graduating here from Drug Court but right. um, so any one of us that participate in drug court and all of the municipalities that dump into Lowell District Court. Is it all oh. family camping or was it Tuxbury family? She didn't even I mean, start yeah. asking questions. It doesn't matter, but I mean, you, do, you can divert her towards me anytime you want. Anybody that has needs any information, you can go to the probation department. The Lowell chief would know the same. Uh, but every one of us, that you know, all of the jurisdictions around here do uh, dump directly into this. Have you been to a graduation yet, by the way? No. They're pretty, We've covered pretty it. emotional. We've covered it. They're pretty emotional. I yeah, went I to one in Malden just a week or two ago. We just had one too. So really emotional. Graduated, uh, really beautiful. People crying. It was really, really. Yeah, we adopted awesome. it. We, we, we graduated an adopted Tuxbury resident on this past <laughs> Tuesday that is at Janet's place, which is a sober living home in Tuxbury that we uh, graduated. And I got to tell you, the road is long. It's four phases of drug court. If you go without relapse and you follow all the rules of the house and everything else, you can get through the four phases in 18 months. We've graduated nobody in less than almost three years. 24 months, I think, is the mm. early graduation of drug court so relapse uh, rule breaking not you know because these individuals that we deal with that have mental health issues and substance use disorders they don't have the basic life skills that everybody else has and they never especially ones that have been long-term mm -hmm. mental health or they they have to learn those too through the recovery process at the treatment programs that they're in so a lot of them may not reuse drugs but they can't follow the rules of the house and may get tossed from one treatment program or another and we have to try to keep getting them into other treatment programs until they can I think, get them the I skills. I think that's a good segue back to... Yeah, yeah. so let's yeah. just so, be clear that that so, was drug court, yeah, yeah, yeah. which, which yeah. actually which is, is an fine. interesting yeah. referral yeah. source and referral, yeah. you know, we can refer so, in and others. But. So do you agree with my statement earlier about this being a monumental shift in the way these low-level low offenders are dealt with by the system. Yeah, I mean, well, I think any time you can get someone that's in crisis and actually get them the services that they need earlier in the in the in their in their cycle, the better, right? I mean, is it appropriate to call them low level offenders? Yes, because they yeah. maybe not yes. have offended yet, though, right? Well, th that's aspirational. Frankly, where we are right now is I think we have to deal with the status quo, which okay. is we're going to start with the people who have three hundred and seventy one encounters. Right. Okay. Um, and we, we, th we think about it in a couple of different buckets of work, mm -hmm. and we're, we're actually funding all of them in some respects. Mm -hmm. One is this, this emergency response, right? So the moment of crisis, the moment of overdose, when law enforcement or EMTs respond, making sure that they have all the tools they need to respond safely. Uh, two is giving a, a place that these folks can go that is not jail or hospital. Right, so these are low-level offenders. They may not need to go into a, a more intensive program. You can divert them, and actually the sheriff has gotten funding to build a restoration center, which is a crisis diversion. It's like an alternate location that can handle the crisis, can help people sober up, and then connect them to services. Uh, and so what, the other thing that we're funding that we'll be announcing tomorrow is actually research to figure out what treatment works because when you're dealing with folks that have multiple different needs, mm -hmm. there's actually not a lot of research out there that says these are the kinds of things mm -hmm. that are going to help these folks. So we we have a lot to still learn. <coughs> and actually the interesting thing right. is we know a lot more on the law enforcement side because they've been doing it longer. Right. Um, so we need to build out these other kind of what is the non-criminal justice response. And then eventually the ultimate goal is that, that no one gets here and no one gets to these guys because we've figured out what are the, the preventative health and social yeah. services that, that stop people from getting there. Peter, one thing we hear from, from law enforcement and from the medical community is there just aren't enough beds. Mm -hmm. there, there's just not enough room for all these kinds of folks. Um, this woman from Cambridge, it's a woman from Cambridge, yes. right? What would be the ideal spot for her if you were able to get... Have you gotten to her? Is, is she in the system? This is just out of or Cambridge. I don't know what they. I don't know what the. Did we know whatever happened with this uh, young woman? I don't know. Cambridge was she giving it gave us that as a proof of concept. Okay, but what's the ideal it's, spot for someone like this? Is it Tewksbury Hospital? Is it? Um, is it like the home that the chief talked about? Like where do you put these people? Because all we hear is there. There's no places. Well, that's true. I mean, 
listen, that's the whole thing. Is we've got to, first we've got to identify the people and then figure out what service we're going to get for them. But there's a lot more service. Listen, Lowell's a great, you know, great town to have resources, right? You've got tons of resources here. You'll have a lot of collaboration. That's why I think a program like this will work especially well because, quite honestly, on the data side, Lowell PD was really strong on the data side. Mm -hmm. um, we've got cooperation from Lowell Community Health Center. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, Mass Hospital Association will also be appearing with us at the larger conference because of the emergency the resident, restoration issue. That this, that this restoration center can actually, that crisis stabilization and evaluation unit, can they can figure out what to do with them from that point on or further them out to the appropriate sources. This has been a model that has worked very well in Miami-Dade County. They've made a minuscule number of arrests from tens of thousands of contacts. Is it being done elsewhere in Massachusetts? Or no, 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 it's, no, it's, no. It's only like probably five places around the country. A few There's places. A growing, around, actually, there's growing a lot number. more doing them now. Yeah, yeah it will be one of the. Arkansas four. actually just funded four. It did. Yeah, the government did. Um, yeah. I'm actually had a question. That was. Oh. What I'm gathering from this is this is on top of um, trying to you know, steer people away from ending up, you know, in prison behind bars. This is also uh, a cost-saving measure, is that accurate? Yeah, Can you yeah. talk more about that? How much, I guess, money do you expect or project that this So, I mean, I'll just get one. Miami-Dade County did a study. I wrote it down here. They had about 100 people that they had counted that did, did um, almost 40,000 days of jail time, hospital time, you know, kind psych of homeless shelter, psych yeah. institution time, 40,000 uh, days. 40,000 days over five years, um, and they said of only 100 of these people, and they said they estimated they cost about $13.7 million. Over a one-year period? Over that five-year five period. Oh, five right. the, the 100 people cost $13.7 million and 40,000 days of, of support and services that, you know, maybe if they had been diverted earlier might not have had to receive so much mm -hmm. at a cost. And besides which, we want the police out kind of doing, you know, um, they're doing it, they've had to take on this role of sort of being a... Well, that's a whole other issue that we haven't talked about here today, the role of social worker. Yep. Yes, right. That's what they're having to do. Yep. You know? And I know that it's made your relationships and community stronger for this social crisis, clinical social worker work that you've done, um, but it, they shouldn't have to be doing that. You know, We should be able to get these help for these people. It, or if the police are coming into contact with them or any other organization, governmental organization or otherwise, to get them into the services without them having to go to yep. police all the time. And well, I think, to, I mean, just to get back to your point on... Yep. And, and so you like a couple of things. I think tell them this one too, Lynn, because that's, that's going to require some study. Pretty yes. yeah. that's a pretty compelling. That's a pretty dense chart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's some data viz that are a little harder to add. So I think we walked into this understanding that treatment capacity is just a problem, right? It's a problem in basically every community that we work with, um, and then also understanding what works. So I think those two things together, we know, are not those are not short-term solutions. But one of the things that we're hoping to do is a, a be able to quantify how many people have how many kinds of problems, what kinds of beds do we need actually, so that oh, you can yeah, right? so you can start to say, hey, we have X number of individuals. These are the very specific mm -hmm. problems that they're having, and therefore this is the kind of capacity we should be building towards. Some of the research that we're doing, we recognize. I spent time working in local government. I know people can't wait until we do our you know six year rigorous research evaluations. What are the interventions that you can do now while we're figuring that out? So a lot of what we're looking at are things like intensive case management. So case management where you actually have one case manager mm -hmm. whose job it is to make sure that you're getting access to services. Mm -hmm. So um, we are, some of the research that we're funding is, some, is called Fact Forensic Assertive Community Treatment, which intentionally focused on people who are just as involved with that serious mental illness to help them stay in the community and not have these encounters. And then we're seeing a growing interest in housing as an intervention. So a lot, for particularly obviously for folks who are homeless who are unstably housed, having housing plus the services uh, we've seen have really dramatic uh, impacts in other mm -hmm. communities. But instead of having to go, and I think this is why, you know, we've been talking about this before, these, these are not new issues. Um, I think what the data brings to the table is the ability to say, okay, we know the status quo is unacceptable, and I think people have gotten a little bit stuck in the, okay, but then what do we do otherwise? And I think this is going to help us all shift to, we can try these other things and have a much clearer understanding, A, of what the needs of these folks are, and B, whether the things that we're doing are working. Right? So the fact that the chief was able to tell you that they've had, the number of graduates that they've had with no recidivism, means they have to track data. And they're tracking it from one court, with this initiative we'll be able to track it all across the county. Right? And we can also track not only are we having, you know, what if, and I'm not saying that this is happening, uh, we were up in our, one of our other communities was Johnson County, Iowa, I was talking to their emergency room director. He says they had an emergency room readmission program. Right? And so their whole, the whole purpose of this program was to keep people from coming back into the ER. 
And he said, look, if we had somebody who had come in five times in a month, and then they didn't come in the next month, that was clearly our because of our program. But he's like, you know what it really could have been? They were in the jail, or they were in a you know they were in an inpatient treatment facility. He said, we have no idea if the things that we're doing are actually causing the things that we want or not. And so some of the things that we think are the real benefit of looking across these different systems is you'll know a lot better is the thing that the intervention that we're doing actually having the impact that we're looking for. Um, so we see this. I think is a real way to accelerate the great work that's already underway here. Who do you, I think for this initiative to be successful, you need, it needs to get a signal from somebody about a person in distress. Whether it's the cops, a hospital, a homeless shelter, an EMT, somebody with tr Trinity. Mm -hmm. who, who do you think you'll rely on the most to flag, like this woman from Cambridge? Yep. You know, I keep going back to this woman, because so this is the one you put in front of us. Right? <laughs> so who who will be most important in this continuum to say, wait a minute, you know, this guy, he's not Pablo Escobar, he's just some nitwit from Middlesex Street that needs help. So this I can so tell who, you. So who Yeah, so actually the technology system that we're providing will allow these cases to, to surface, mm -hmm. right? So you can actually, the technology will allow us to surface the highest utilizers. Yeah. And then you can, we could take this piece of paper and we can say, look, she, uh, she's had multiple suicide attempts and she's overdosed multiple times. Yeah. This is where your project manager is gonna be so helpful. Right. Okay. Who is the best person to, to find this person, right? If she does in fact have another police encounter, right? So as we're out looking for her, if she comes into one of these systems, knowing that she's somebody that we should be paying special attention to, you can flag that in the system. Mm. So no matter what door this woman hits in, a, in an ideal state, and I'm not saying that's gonna happen right off the bat. Right, we it's gonna take, take time. Some work, but in, a, in an ideal state, which I think is eminently achievable in the next two years, this person could hit any one of these systems and you would be able to say, hey, this is somebody we need to do something different with. And the data should flow generally. The data, because there's going to be HIPAA protected data and criminal sort of criminal justice. Quarry stuff, uh, right? Quarry stuff, right? So um, Lynn's going to, the setup is going to be so that you will only have certain access if you, are, if you are allowed to have access to those records. A lot of the information, so the police will have uh, access to a lot of their criminal justice information across jurisdictions, so they'll have a greater wealth of knowledge about that individual, so the people that are getting hit a few times in Tewksbury might be hit a bunch more times in another community Tim might not know about, but the idea is then that the information, a lot of that information can flow up to the healthcare provider so they can understand what's going on for mm -hmm. that individual, and then maybe while some of that healthcare data can't flow back, it can be a flag um, for law enforcement to understand this person has these types of issues somehow without violating HIPAA. So it'll create a greater um, flow of information back and forth. Have you hired out. the project director yet? We're actually in the process of doing it. It's going to be someone... That's a big job. It's a big job, yeah. <laughs> well, the great thing... I'll say about so this... So that person work for you or work for the foundation? Nope. <clears throat> work for them. Well, it's kind of working. Is it... <laughs> <laughs> you guys better get it right now. They're going to be working in our space, but yeah, they're so going to they get paid. For we pay. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. going to get. I guess yeah. They're going to get paid not by us, but through through the organization. Okay. It's a different name. Okay. But yeah, this person that we've got in mind is going to be is extremely sharp. She's very driven. She can because that's the most important thing. And, and the thing about the Arnold Foundation is they give you the resources to pay a fair amount, so you don't have to get a junior person for something that needs a senior person for the job. That was honestly great because honestly I didn't want to do it half-assed and the Arnold Foundation is, you know, it's not exorbitant funding but it's enough to hire a qualified professional to do well, it. Let me even a follow-up when you hire somebody. Can you just give us a thumbnail? What is the Arnold Foundation? Just in sure. 100 words or less. So we're a founder-led, so Laura and John Arnold uh, actually run the organization day-to-day. -day. Yep. We were started about eight years ago. Uh, Laura and John, John did very well in energy investing and so they signed the giving pledge where they're giving the majority of their wealth into the foundation to give away. So they've been involved in a number of different issue mm -hmm. areas from the start. They started off with education, moved very quickly into criminal justice. Most of our work yeah. in criminal justice has been in the pretrial kind mm -hmm. of bail reform space. Um, and actually, when I joined from the White House, I started to push us further up into the emergency response. Are they local? Are they in Massachusetts? They're in uh, Houston, based in Houston. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to understand, this is a national pilot. So there's mm -hmm. one in, uh, tell us about the other two. So Johnson County, Iowa, which is our sweet, what we try to do is figure out uh, different jurisdictions that where any community across the country could look at that jurisdiction and say, I, that looks like me and I, I know I can do that. So we picked one relatively small one, Johnson uh, uh, County, Iowa. Interesting you picked Iowa. Yeah. Because it is considered by many to be ground zero. 
in terms of drugs and meth. Yeah. And so that's a population of 120,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then we have Middlesex, which is our largest jurisdiction, and we'll get back to Middlesex in a moment. And then we have City of Long Beach, uh, which is about 600,000 uh, folks, and obviously entirely urban within LA County. So we were trying, and then Middlesex really is kind of everything, right? Mm -hmm. We've got urban, we've got suburban, we've got <laughs> That's rural. Sure. It's yeah. everything, right? Yeah. That's why I say it's a great one to, yeah. if we can make it work here, it's much more replicatable across the country because you could do it in Boston or something like that, but then you can't replicate it mm -hmm. in suburban yeah. towns. And here we've got urban, suburban, and rural, and we don't have like one couple of teaching hospitals right in the center of town with a vast resources. Um, so if you can make it work here, you can actually make it work, I think, across the country more easily. Yeah. Lynn, what was it about Middlesex County? Um, how we, you might have touched on this earlier, mm -hmm. but how were you guys brought together? Was it the White House you yeah. said, Peter? Yeah, it was a dear friend of mine who helped me on this initiative, sat on a panel with the sheriff and like immediately came running over to me afterwards and said, we've got to get Middlesex. So he basically sold Middlesex County to be included in yep. the initiative. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, you participated. Yeah, but the police didn't too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, no, I know. Because when I when I said to the chief, they just signed up. What what made us a hero was, I mean, firstly, I did engage with Dave, and it was just kind of you know we were we'd like this is great, let's do something. Yeah. But when I reached out and twenty one police departments said, yeah, I'll sign on like that, they were like, whoa, that's amazing, and it kind of immediately drew attention to us. We began to work more and more, not with the idea that we'd be a pilot. It was far off from that point. But the fact is. There was so much synergy going on in Middlesex, aside from the fact that I was really excited about this and driven and we did a lot of great work and he was, you know, I think he was impressed with our presentation when we signed up 21 departments right <laughs> off the bat. I think they were just like, that's a place we want to go yeah. to. Kevin, we'll need a list of those 21 departments. Yeah, we'll get so to that whole list. But when we were back at the White House, I mean, honestly, most of what we did, we used to have um, conference calls every two weeks, which was crazy in retrospect. I don't know how we managed to do that. But most of it was literally just finding communities that were doing something, putting them on the phone. So we would talk for five minutes, then we'd have communities talk, and then we'd have just questions. Because our whole philosophy was, first of all, so many we know so many places want to do this, and they just don't know how. Mm -hmm. right? And so we thought that if we could just share information about different projects that were working, A, to your point, right? Sometimes it's the best thing to learn is what didn't work. Mm -hmm. Like, don't do that. Yeah. Or, like, I want to do this program, and I know somebody else has done it, and therefore I'm going to talk to this person. So we literally just served mostly as a convener and a catalyst. Um, because what we want to do, I, our main thing was don't reinvent the wheel. If somebody else has done it, I'm going to connect you to that person, and you talk to that person, and you can skip ahead. And so really the, that from that, this proof of concept site emerged where we realized what communities really need is just a really clear how-to. How do I get from, I'm really interested and I want to solve this, to starting to solve it? Um, and so we think that these sites, what we can do with these sites, buy. And, you know, it's a good investment. We're really excited about it. It's not an insignificant amount of money, but it's mm -hmm. two people and a technology system. That's not, I mean, that's manageable if we can show that it works. And we, we firmly believe that it will generate cost savings, so it should more than pay for itself. But what we really wanted to say was, hey, if you've got strong leadership, you've got strong buy-in with these three things, we think we can really just accelerate you. And at the end of the two years, you know, are we going to solve this person's problem? Are we going to solve the treatment capacity? Probably not. Are we going to make it a lot easier to find people and start to figure out what works to help them? Absolutely. We'll understand it better. And quite honestly, having the data, then you can make better decisions. I mean, I said... I've said this before, you know, we'll, we'll run data through a program or, you know, we'll, we'll know something's going on with a program, but until you see the data like showing you in black and white right in front of you, this is what's going on, you don't make a decision sometimes because you just, you know, it still feels like a leap of faith and you, instinctually you know it. But when you see the numbers, like, okay, now we got to do something. So just seeing the numbers is going to be a crucial part of what we do. Um, and I think that's going to drive the understanding about what services are necessary out there. Um, in a way that, you know, we can't right now because we're just guessing. It's like the military veterans, you know, I, when we started that unit, I was doing a whole search around the country, tell me how many military veterans we have incarcerated. They, they, they had no idea because they don't have a system where that we started here, which is the Veterans Reentry Research, where we ran our database to the VA and they said, these people are veterans, right? So then we knew exactly how many veterans we had in ours. And lo and behold, the number was two-thirds more than it self-reported, which was one of the figures that I saw that were vastly different across the nation. One was, they figured there's probably two-thirds more than are self-reporting, and that's exactly what we found. So, you know, how can you how can you build damn programs if you don't even know how many people are incarcerated that have served our country? Once you get the information, then you can make decisions, and, and, that's, and that's what I think is going to be a big step for us right here. Yeah. 
And you also think that we'll obviously leave that behind, but Cambridge PD did some case studies for us. And I, we're hearing it today, right? The number of police contacts that people have where the police are just trying to solve their problems for them, like the, it's an extraordinary use of public safety resources for what are fundamentally social services. Mm -hmm. And the police are doing it because they're the only ones, right? But that, like, really, we, the police are responsible for the safety of our community. And so I think having those numbers in front of people, you know, if I'm a policymaker, if I'm a legislature, I will, I'm going to want to know where am I going to want to put my resources, right? And thank God the police have stepped up in that way. But if you would like to have your police working on crime prevention, then you can make different choices. Isn't that, and this is maybe getting off, off topic here just for a second, and I think we could wrap up, but the police services uh, being used for mostly social services, isn't that part of the problem with police today in terms of lack of proper training in which you see you know incidents happen across the country that don't turn out so well either for um, um, the suspect or the police department I'm trying to be delicate there no no and I, I, yeah you know I what get, I mean I, I mean where you're going with it's that the lack of training is, is it not it's very true but in this area we've been very fortunate right. with respect to that but in this area most a lot of municipalities, many more probably than have signed on to the DDJ, have signed on to the One Mind campaign, mm -hmm. which was an IACP-driven program that you dedicated, you know, 100% of your uh, sworn police officers would get eight hours of mental health first aid for first responders, so they would get de-escalation techniques, recognition techniques for all different <laughs> versions of mental health, you, go, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And then when you interact with somebody, it doesn't end up going to the ground or to the taser or to the... Uh, baton or to anything like that because you have the skill set now to recognize somebody in some level of mental health and what's going to work and what isn't going to work. So there's eight hours there and then now there's that CIT training where they're asking you to dedicate 20% of your department. Now we're we're looking to dedicate 100% of our department to CIT and as a matter of fact we just applied into a grant to get our JDP mental health clinician and to be designated as a model site in Tewksbury so that we can provide that training not only to the four towns in the collaboration but throughout the whole Middlesex County to other individuals so that offices have a better skill set when they interact with these type of individuals and the outcomes would be better. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you firsthand that I've been a police officer for 31 years. It is very rewarding for SWAN offices to see something through. And when I say see something through, I mean not just arrest somebody and then that's the end of it. No. See what it is that's causing the issue that resulted in the arrest, divert that individual to an area where they could get some help for that, and not and see a happy ending. Because I think everybody loves happy endings, right? So I think in, in, in the end, like in the beginning, this was a tough concept to have SWAN offices buy into. And, uh, you, know, you know, that whole aspect that you're talking about, it being not our job, it's somebody else's. But we were acting on an island, independent of everybody else. Now when you built those bridges over to the other islands, to the treatment providers, to the people that collect the data, to the, uh, you know, the clinicians, the prevention specialists, like in Tuxedo alone we have a four-person team, a community service officer, a family service officer, a prevention specialist on a grant, and a mental health clinician on a grant. The four of them meet weekly. They go over their cases together. They go over the prevention steps that we're taking so that we can provide uh, treatment to people or get, give people help before they actually need it. So, the results yep. of all of that have really changed the way that we do policing, and it's become re rewarding for our guys. I have offices that actually come upstairs regularly with individuals that they see over and over again, or that they see that they know they need help, and could have easily have arrested them for a, a petty crime or diverted them through protective custody to the hospital and forgotten about them at that particular point, or, or held them for protective custody for up to 12 hours when it was an alcohol-related issue, who truly now want to get that individual help. So now they're looking to get upstairs to the community service team to try to be involved in getting that into per that person to a productive lifestyle, uh, you know, happy ending, say, in the end. So, I mean, there is a lot of reward in this. And I understand there's a lot of social work aspect of that, but when, let's face it, when we have all of our car breaks, our house breaks, our shopliftings, our robberies, they all revolve around addiction or some level of mental health issue, right? They do. There is very few Bonnie and Clyde, you went to Hill Gang crimes anymore. It's, it's over. Yeah. Everything is relative to substance use disorder or mental health. Yeah. So if we, if we take the stance that we want to reduce crime in our communities every year, because that's what the police is supposed to do, make yeah. a community safer, reduce crime, well, how do we do that? 
How do we do that? Well, traditionally, just arresting somebody and sending them to court and hoping for the best hasn't worked. Hasn't worked. Right? So now we connect people to services. We don't see them again. The results will, you know, and obviously we've only entered into this in the last couple of years. We've yeah. really gone full-blown into this. So I think the results are yet to come. It's hard to quantify the results right this moment in time. Like as when I told you earlier, is our drug court the only drug court in the whole entire United States that hasn't had anybody reoffend after they graduated? I can't tell you that for sure, but the talk was with Marie Burke, who's sat in on most all of the drug courts that have opened up in the state of Massachusetts. It's we're the only one that she knows of and has attended a, a lot of conferences where they haven't had somebody reoffend since graduation. So, yeah, will th would those data sets be great if we had those down the road? Absolutely great. You know what I mean? To see what, what's working and what mm -hmm. isn't. Because that's what we're doing here, right? That's good. Can't be anything else. I think we're. No, I think it's long overdue. Yeah.